Hi, everyone. Um, wonderful. Wow. We have well over uh, 80 people already uh, joining us. Uh, I'm slowly uh, going to kind of uh, get the ball rolling as, as more people uh, join and, and, uh, and uh, settle in and, and, and as we get started. Um, my name is Arto Vaughn. I'm the executive director of Project Save Photograph uh, Archives. Um, and uh, I'm so happy that you're all uh, joining us today uh, for our, our third Conversations on Photography uh, speaker series. Um, I'm going to very, very, very briefly uh, say a few words about Project Save, uh, about this uh, particular series that we started a few months ago. Um, and then um, I will from there move on to what we're gonna be discussing uh, today, uh, which I'm very excited about. And then I'll, I'll introduce our uh, speakers and we'll, we'll take it from there. Um, so uh, for, for some of you who, who might be new uh, to Project Save, um, Project Save Photograph Archives uh, was founded almost now 50 years ago, um, uh, officially in 1975 in New York City by our founder, Ruth uh, Tomasian. Uh, who's, who's also uh, joining us today. Um, and so for nearly 47, 48 years now, uh, Project Save is the oldest and only archive that, that has been documenting hard copy photographs of the Armenian global experience. Um, as I was just saying to, to Mark uh, Arslan, he was, he was asking uh, what, what this background is. Um, today, I decided to, to do the uh, to host the event uh, directly from the actual archives. So uh, we have two offices. Uh, we have our administrative office. This is the actual archives here. So uh, as I say, at, um, we don't have an exact count, but it's, it's well over 70,000 hard copy photographs. Um, this particular series, Conversations on Photography, that we're doing um, was something that I, I wanted to do to open up Project Save at this point uh, to a, a broader demographic, to those who are more online, who are more kind of uh, technically savvy, um, but also to, to uh, uh, we really want to open up Project Save uh, as an archive that is championing photography, uh, even though our focus is on the Armenian experience. At the end of the day, we're a photography archive. So we're, we're, we're always uh, interested in and concerned in and excited about the power and the beauty and the impact uh, of photography. Um, this is the third in our series. Um, and I should mention, by the way, just so that I don't forget later, um, this today's particular event um, is also co-sponsored by Nasser, the National Association for, for Armenian Studies and Research, and by the Armenian Cultural Foundation, both of which are also here in the Boston area. So I thank them very much, uh, to, uh, thanks to Mark and thanks to uh, Ara. Um, so we're, we're happy to have them as co-sponsors. Um, uh, our first two talks in this series, uh, one was by Tatiana uh, Cole, who's one of our new advisory board members. She talked about preservation and the uh, overall uh, power and importance of archives and photography. Um, our next speaker was uh, Nazik Armenakian, who's one of the leading photographers in Armenia right now who runs a wonderful collective of, of uh, photographers, uh, mostly female photographers in Armenia, and they do really cutting edge innovative work. And now the, the third uh, uh, presentation that we have um, is um, by some local folks from Massachusetts, uh, Gregory Jundanyan and Lisa Misakyan, who are gonna be talking about the Armenians of Whitensville, uh, a project that they and a few others have co-founded that really focuses on the, the truly incredible uh, historic Armenian community in White, Whitensville, Massachusetts. Um, and I should say that I'm a little bit biased because my dad's side um, is, is kind of from Whitensville. They were there uh, in the 60s and, and 70s. So um, I'm very particularly pleased to be hosting this event. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm going to uh, do a little introduction of, of Greg and Lisa, and then I'm gonna turn it over to them. And then they will present for about 20 or 30 minutes, after which we'll open it up to discussion and, and, and questions. 
Um, feel free at any time uh, to enter your comments and questions so that uh, we will kind of take note of those and then pass them along to Greg and, and Lisa. Uh, and also speak up if somehow you can't hear me or you can't hear Greg or Lisa, let us know if there's any kind of technical issue. Um, before I do that, I also want to particularly thank my, my staff. Um, you know, uh, Project Save is really growing this past year in many ways. Uh, we have all these new initiatives, uh, the conversations on photography series. In the fall, we have our first artist in residency program. And then we're also going to be doing a scholar in residency program. So there's a lot. Uh, we're launching a brand new website uh, very soon. So there's a lot going on. And, and a lot of it just could not happen without our, our growing staff. So, so to uh, Margaret and to Marta, our wonderful archivists, um, uh, thank you very much. So um, I'm gonna get started with it, some introduction. So first, Gregory Jundanyan is gonna be our first uh, uh, speaker. Uh, Gregory Jundanyan grew up in Whitensville. He's a second generation Armenian American. His ancestors immigrated to the US uh, before 1915 from Parchanj and Arabkir. Uh, uh, both uh, regions in, in Kharpert, of uh, parts of ancient Armenia and now central uh, Turkey. Greg's a photographer. He focuses on identity and community. Uh, he's an MFA candidate currently in photography at the University of Hartford. And he's actively involved uh, as one of the founders in the Three, Three Squares New England, which is a hunger relief nonprofit that serves greater Boston, which is of course, uh, uh, other than the artistic endeavors that he has, that, that's a wonderful thing that he's a part of. So I'm gonna first turn it over to Greg. Uh, before I do, I'm also gonna introduce Lisa so that, that Greg can turn it over to her. Um, Lisa Misakian uh, also has Whitensville roots. Uh, they stretch back to the 1880s, wow, to the 1880s when her grandfather first arrived uh, from Parchanj, uh, followed by her other grandparents from Hulti. Yarasa, uh, from Khurtik, Yarasad, and Sivas. Uh, they came between 1919 and 1921. Although her family moved to Connecticut in 1973, they remained close to the Whitensville community. Uh, Lisa recently retired from a long career of, of guiding human resources and strategies for globally operating nonprofits. And she's currently researching her own family's history and story. So I, I thank you to both Greg and to Lisa, and I'll turn it over to Greg to get us started. Great, thank you, Arto. Um, first of all, this is a great opportunity for us. So really appreciate the time and that everybody's spending to listen to us tonight and to Project Save for hosting and for Nasser and the Armenian Cultural Center for co-hosting. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. We've been excited about this for a while. Um, I also want to thank the Armenian community uh, and Dare Mikhail of the Armenian Whitensville Church uh, for his support and to the Armenian Cultural Association of America, who is acting as our fiscal sponsor so that all donations are tax deductible. Well, so we're excited to have you guys here this evening. But before I start, I just want to introduce you to the team and thank those who've helped to make this possible. You know, behind the project is uh, not only Lisa and myself, but Jeff Kalustian, who lives in Whitensville now. All three of us were from Whitensville originally. In addition, Mark Arslan from the Armenian Immigration Project is tying each of the families to historical records, such as ship manifests, naturalization papers, that kind of thing. Nick Boyajan, who's worked countless hours designing the site, continues to be on call when there's issues. And Nicole Taraverdian, who has been helping us organize the recipe page and collection, as you'll see. Outside of this core group, We've had many volunteers helping us with everything from translating, designing our logo, transcribing recipe cards, subtitling videos, and searching through old copies of Spindle magazines so that we can create a database of everybody who had been working and mentioned in the magazines that are factory magazine and white and scope from the White and Machine Works. So without these people's interest, um, there's no way we could be here today without their interest and their help and their compassion, we wouldn't be here. So you now we're part of this series. Photographs are the backbone of our website. So as I go through the introduction, I thought it'd be interesting to cycle through a few of the photographs quite randomly um, that we've been working with. So let me share the screen and hopefully I don't screw this up. Here we go. Um, so play from the start, okay. 
So the Armenians of Waynesville project is a digital archive focusing on diaspora and identity as seen through the eyes of the Armenian community in Waynesville. The project pays respect to those that came before us, celebrates a special community, and looks at how our identity has evolved over some 130 to 140 years. Yes, it's about the past, but it's also about putting together something for future generations that might open a, you know, a box of photographs someday and wonder who is this person or look at an object and not know the connection. So we're trying to draw those connections so that our descendants uh, and families, uh, descendants of other families will have that advantage. The objective this evening is to walk through our project, explain what we're thinking, speak to you about why we're doing this, and letting you know how you can participate if you like. And after we're done, as Ardo said, he'll moderate the questions. But if there's any questions that you might think of later, you know, our emails on our website, info at armeniansofwhitensville.org, please feel free to mail us the question and we'll answer it uh, as soon as possible. So uh, our presentation is part of Project Saves Conversations and Photography Series, as you know, and for 50 years, Project Saves done a spectacular job collecting photographs in the diaspora and using them to piece together the stories and histories of our various communities. They're an inspiration to what we do, but there is a difference. We're focusing on one community. We're a digital archive. We don't collect physical photographs. We do uh, advise the folks that we're with who are participating to please turn over photographs to Project Save when they're, when they're ready to do so. Um, and we use other devices besides the photograph to complement the narrative, such as recordings, images of recipe cards, images of documents, and memory objects. So what is the project all about? What is the tradition? Why are we doing this? The project is a riff off the Armenian tradition of the memory book, or Hushamadian, as it's called. The memory book was born out of, this tra out of the tragedy of the Armenian diaspora. I don't know if it's unique to the Armenian diaspora or not, but it is a pretty unique uh, set of documents. People wrote books about the villages they knew they, they would disappear, or they'd never get back to, in an effort to try to preserve the memory for years to come. I mean, Whitensville, for instance, was generally populated by people from the small village of Basmashan, a village of maybe 800 to 1,000 people. Yet there's at least three lengthy volumes on the subject of Basmashan. We have all three of these on our website translated into English. The Library of Congress has over 200 examples of different Armenian memory books in their collection. People who came here had their families and communities ripped apart and they came with nothing and at a time when there was no institutional assistance on any level. People pulled together as a community for purposes of identity and so they might have the support system necessary to survive. Our efforts are a recognition and a celebration of this effort. We're interested not only in the old stories, the origination stories, but also in the first, second, and third generation stories, or how identity has actually evolved. I know that we probably swore we'd never do something we hated that our parents did, but found ourselves doing the same thing many years later. Uh, it's not to say that identity doesn't evolve, it does, but it's heavily influenced by family and community and culture. So what we're specifically exploring is how our Armenian heritage influenced our identity today and Whitensville is the portal we use to explore that. Part of the change to our identity has been intermarriage, which didn't happen much in, my, in our parents' generation and now it's pretty common. It's important to us that both sides are included because that is now part of our identity and we hope that we'll be telling those stories also. Not to digress too far, but this is an issue of tension inside of most immigrant communities and especially refugee communities specifically. People come here with nothing except their culture and their belief system. That's all they have. They embrace the opportunity to start anew. It's a little bit awkward. They don't wanna lose the value system learned over generations. So it's a balancing act to blend in the best of each culture. So in addition to building this tool to look at our Armenian identity, we hope that what we are building can be a format or a tool that more recent refugee communities can use to think about their own community and identity. We'd be happy to help people do that. Um, so uh, as a side note, I mean, it's common if you're Armenian that your grandparents or your parents never talked about these issues of you know, what happened uh, to them. So a lot of history disappeared, both because of the genocide and because of this tradition of not talking about it. That was behind them in their mind. The task at hand was to survive in a new country, which is hard enough, 
in a new culture. And while there's much missing, there's still much left to discover. You know, each of us, each person that's participating in the project has learned something about their family they didn't know before, which has been uh, pretty satisfying. And lastly, storytelling amplifies empathy and the world can always use just a little bit more of that. So before we get into speaking about the project specifically, I'd like to explain how one can participate alongside us just in case while you're listening, you'd like to assist. So there's four ways. The first is pretty easy, sign up for our uh, newsletter. Uh, the second is uh, you could contribute your family story if you're from Whitensville, or uh, if you know people who've had um, ancestors from Whitensville, if you're descendant. You know, we started, we, I think we have like 13 families up now. We hope to get between 50 and 100 families when all is said and done. The only requirement is that your family had to be living in Whitensville, whether it was a month or their entire lives. And, um, and if, for instance, we're working on a, with a family out of Fresno that had uh, their grandmother had been through Whitensville for six months in 1920. Um, so if you're not from Whitensville, but you live in the area like Upton, Uxbridge, Menden, whatever, Hop, Copedale, um, and you're part of the community, there's also ways to contribute. Um, the project is high touch. We continue to need volunteers. Specifically, we could use help working with families, especially with older people who do not have computers, with translations, transcriptions, tagging content, development, writing in general. There's a strong possibility that we might be developing a video-based oral history component and we'll need help there with setup and interviewing. So to date, the project's been self-funded. This is the fourth way. We can't finish the work we began without financial help. So if you'd like to donate either by check or electronically, please go to our website to do so. It'd be much appreciated. So people you know, often thank us for doing this and always ask why. You know, I can't speak for the others that are involved, but as Arto said, I'm an MFA candidate uh, at the University of Hartford. I had done some work in Armenia and Artsakh in 2019 about identity and community, had planned to do more there and then COVID hit. So I started thinking about what I could do here in the States and that led me to start thinking about doing something in my hometown of Whitensville on, the, on a similar subject. So I'm going to turn this over to Lisa now, who's going to share some information about Whitensville in general and give you guys some context. So Lisa, let me stop the share. Here you go. Thank you, Greg. Um, when you think of towns or communities in Massachusetts with a deep history of Armenian, for Armenian Americans, the first communities you think of generally are Worcester or Watertown, but we believe there's a third W community that needs some attention, and that's our wonderful town of Whitensville. So where is Whitensville, Massachusetts? It's a small village in the town of Northbridge, which is halfway between the much larger Worcester and Providence Armenian communities. Today's population is approximately 16,000, but it was only 4,000 when Armenians first arrived in the 1880s. Uh, that at that time, the town was about 100 years old. It, it had been incorporated just before the American Revolution. So why did the Armenians first come to Whitensville? The White Machine Works was the answer. At the time that they first arrived, the White Machine Works was one of the largest textile machinery factories in the world. And the White and family, which owned the factory and built much of the town that was named after it, recruited workers worldwide, including from Armenia and built many of the public and community services and housing for their factory workers and families. As Greg mentioned, many of the first to arrive in Whitensville were men from Basmashen, a completely Armenian village that was approximately nine miles west of the fortress in Karpet in the plains of what is now Eastern Turkey. But other villages were also represented among those earliest to arrive. Many of these men made multiple round trips between their villages and Whitensville. 
we believe Armenian men may have been in town as early as the 1870s, but none were listed in the 1880 census. As the 1890 census records were burned in a fire, the first surviving census listing Armenians in town was the 1900 census, where you can see 106 Armenians of the 7,000 Americans living in town. Um, among those 106 Armenians, you see the first families, the first births in town, and the majority were single men boarding together and working at the white machine works. Between 1910 and 1920, the town's population grew by almost 1,400. One third of this growth were Armenians, including 160 children born in Massachusetts in that short span of time. In that 1920 census, you see many more families, including marriages that took place in town to create new families. 75% of the Armenians were living in their families. The remainder were boarders, either living with some of those families or still living in their group homes. By the mid 1920s, organizations and businesses start to take root within the community. The Armenian political clubs were already operating and listed in 1926 directories, along with 20 Armenian owned businesses. After the 1929 Great Depression, some families moved away. It took many more years to raise the money to build and consecrate the church in 1957. The church's name, Sorbas Fadzadzin, honor, honors the Armenian Apostolic Church in the village of Basmasha. As we began our research, we made some important early discoveries, including a letter written to Arthur Whiten, one of the founding family members, passed on to Greg from the town's historical society. Research into the letter to the author of the letter, Clara Hamlin Lee, led to discovering its historic significance beyond the context of our project. That discovery was written up in the Armenian Weekly and in the Agos newspaper in Turkish. Both of these articles, as well as the original letter, can be found on our website. Among our own personal collections, we found photos and books including the Basmashen picnic photo that you see on our landing page, the Armenian Legionnaires panoramic photo that I'll show you later, and a 1930 ARS album with a few fantastic early Whitensville photos. We uncovered more and more treasures working on our own family stories and helping our first contributing families. I'm gonna stop the share right now so I can turn the presentation back over to Greg who will bring up the website and walk you through its architecture and introduce you to some of the families and their collections. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, I do want to say what Lisa didn't say was that the article in Turkey uh, in Istanbul that was published uh, was called, Where is Whitensville, where is Basmashan? So when people ask me where Whitensville is, I always say, if you're, if you're traveling between Providence and Worcester, take the exit that says Purgatory. And believe it or not, for those of you unfamiliar with the area, there is an exit saying Purgatory, and that's where Whitensville is. Um, so what I want to do now is walk you through the website. But before I begin, uh, I just want to say a couple of things. What you're going to see today is, is like akin to going to a new restaurant, opening night. Everything's on the menu, but things aren't necessarily all working correctly, and that's just fine. I mean, what we hope to show you is the foundation of what we've been working on, and that you'll be excited about it, and um, that, you know, you got to start somewhere, so this is where we're starting. Uh, and this is an archival website, uh, which reminds me of a story, the only story I remember by Richard Brodigan, who was an author in the 60s and early 70s. He wrote a story about a library where authors would bring their manuscripts to die, and I kind of think of an archive a little bit like that. The danger in the archive is you collect stuff and nobody ever sees it, nobody ever uses it. And we're going to great lengths to try to design the website so it's easy to use. And also the people wanna use it and visit it for other reasons. And to that end, um, we are doing a lot of work with the recipe and the recording section. So um, the website is designed into two collections. Uh, families and community. I'm going to go through the family collection, then I'll hand it back to Lisa to go through what we're doing on the community side. 
families are the foundation of any community and certainly the foundation of our site. And if I go into family here, um, I should actually go in through this photograph of Lisa's dad's wedding, which I didn't realize of this tradition where grooms went into the bride's house the night before and stole stuff and then brought it to the wedding to trade it for drinks. Now, why anybody would accept an ironing board back, why the bride would do that, I have no idea. But anyways, that's the tradition and I had never heard of it, so I learned something. So if you go into families here, you can see that each family is represented by a portal or a thumbnail. And you go into the thumbnail and you can see um, you know, what's happening. So if I go into my family, for instance, you can see that there are first, to, to start the process, we ask that uh, somebody participating creates a biography uh, that goes from as far back as they can through uh, Whitensville. We then, uh, we actually, Mark Arslan who's on the call, has this magnificent uh, project that he's single-handedly doing called the Armenian Immigration Project. And he's tying uh, records out to people. So if you click on this, for instance, my grandmother, you can see that uh, she, when she came, the boat she came on, that she was five foot two, although she looked a lot taller when I was four, and she had a scar on her left cheek. I don't remember that, but, and then where she lived, um, and, you know, a whole bunch of information that Mark's been able to tie together. So that's actually pretty interesting. Um, but after we get this, we really, you know, ask people to look into their, um, Look for photographs, which is the mainstay, memory objects, recipes, documents, and recordings. Those are the five categories. What I want to start with is, uh, I'm going to go through all these, but I will start with recordings and end with photographs. Uh, recordings are, you know, we have like two songs from my grandmother sang in an old 78 record in the 1920s that Ara Dinkshin and Harut Arkelian helped me digitize. Um, and we have an interview that uh, Craig Wallen did with his grandmother in the late 70s, I believe. And uh, that interview, I won't play it all, but you can see the transcription. You can see what we did in this. It was Craig had translated it and we had, um, you know, we subtitled it so people can read it and listen to it if they don't speak Armenian. Uh, recordings, going back to recordings for a second. Um, I used to think that this was just crazy when I listened to it as a little kid, but now I kind of appreciate it. Here we have done the Armenian and the English translation, and then we've subtitled this also. What we hope to do is have, uh, we have like three other um, oral histories that we're working on right now. One we've completely uh, translated and subtitled and transcribed. Another one we've translated, another one we're gonna be working on soon. So. We'll have those up along with these, but really what this area of the site's gonna be is for more modern oral, his oral histories um, that we hope to start once we get settled. Uh, but this is the recordings area. The recipes are something that everybody loves. And I actually came to this recipe, the idea of the recipes, because I was talking to Lucy Kaboyan. Here she is. Um, Lucy, I asked Lucy, like, Thinking, you know, I was asking her about photographs. I asked her, what would you save if the house was burning down? Because I wanted to see what her most valuable photograph was. And she said, uh, my chicken book. I go, what's a chicken book? And she goes, it's my recipe book with the chicken on it, as you can see. There's no chicken recipes in this book, but there's plenty of recipes. So we scanned them and put them in, edited them. We have uh, each of these are transcribed. Each of the recipes are transcribed for ease of use. Uh, and also they're printable. And like the photographs, people can make comments on them and um, once they try them. So people are pretty excited about the recipes and recipes kind of like photographs, recipe cards, I should say, like physical photographs aren't happening anymore. I mean, when you go to, when you used to go to somebody's house and you like something, they would make up a recipe card for you and you take it home and you put it in your recipe box. They don't, that doesn't happen. The same with photographs. There's more photographs than ever before, but people don't print them. So it's, these are two things, I wouldn't say relics, but they're two things that the digital age has changed uh, quite a bit. So uh, I'm gonna go back in the recipes just for a second to show you what we're doing here. We've uh, entered it 
we've, uh, you know, you can see the beauty of some of these recipes, you can just tell which ones have been used a lot um, over time. And they have sort of a beauty to them. And we've tried to preserve that through the way we've scanned them and edited them. But you'll see that you can search uh, for, let's use the word bulgur, which is spelled like six different ways, but we've got it spelled in all those different ways behind the cards. And we, you know, we can bring up the recipe. This is, by the way, a fantastic recipe um, for each or makhema, they call it. It's a great vegetarian dish too. Uh, or you can go, you can look at, um, you can go whether it's Armenian or everything else or by meal type. And you can also, uh, what's interesting here is that there's four people in the system so far with recipes. And yet there are nine recipes for simi and type in jello, it's unbelievable. There are maybe 20 or 30 recipes using jello molds and jello, which is certainly uh, a leftover from the 50s and the 60s. But recipes were kind of the thing, the first front of acculturation. I mean, people came here, they tried to cook their ethnic dishes, they realized they didn't have all the ingredients, they started using American ingredients, they started meeting Americans, and before you know it, people was exchanging recipes, and this is kind of the natural part of assimilation that happens. So we find that very interesting. Um, so we have probably about two or 300 recipes so far. We hope to have a couple thousand by the time all is said and done. And it's a lot of fun to look through them. And we have volunteers um, who are not Armenian just through volunteermatch.com who are transcribing these. And I mean, it's, it, it's, not, uh, it's not an easy task, especially the Armenian recipes where things are spelled phonetically. So back to family here, I just wanna go back into this. Um, I'll do documents next. Documents, we have some great documents. We have identification papers that car people carried in their pockets through you know, their getting out of Armenia, and that, maybe through the marches or maybe through just immigration, but they're beautiful. They're really beautiful objects. We don't have any up right now, but we will have those. We have those scanned and ready to put up. We have uh, postcards. A uh, collection of postcards uh, written in Arabic, Turkish, and French to a family in Whitensville in the 1920s that we hope to translate and sort of put that story back together as to what was going on in their lives. And then we have uh, documents. These are documents for our family. We have uh, oral history that one of my brothers erased for taping Three Dog Night, but I was uh, luckily I typed it up, and um, you know it's it's pretty intense of my dad when he was my age. And he's after this, he never talked again. It was the one time he talked and we found out some stuff which kind of surprised us um, through that process. Um, other, oral, other things in here that are kind of interesting, there's an article about my great, great uncle who was uh, picked to assassinate a, a Hanchak Zagan leader in Roxbury. Luckily, he didn't kill him. He did shoot him and went to jail in Texas got out of jail, learned Spanish while he was there, skipped bail and went to Cuba where he was a cobbler and helped Armenians who couldn't get in through uh, Ellis Island to get in through Cuba. But the most interesting document was this right here, which is, you know, I found this in the back of a photo album. My dad had changed his name from Eliza Creekcourt Jandanian to Joseph Russell Owens when he was 21 and then changed it again two years later to Joseph George Chandanian, and I was kind of amazed by that. I had never known that. So coming back into the family, um, one of the objects that got me thinking about all this was this innocuous piece of lace. This lace was made, I had a, a my grandfather's first cousin had died from gas poisoning in World War I. And when my grandfather buried him, this man's sister sent this piece of lace that she had made. And I thought, oh my, from Istanbul. So I thought, oh my God, we have Turkey. We have uh, relatives in Turkey that I didn't know about. So I got a DNA test. I tried to find this Ajin line, which led to a lot of really neat discoveries, but I didn't find this particular line. I did find Ajins um, elsewhere. In fact, I had lunch with, my mother had lunch. My mother's is 97. Uh, had lunch with her 98-year-old second cousin who she had never known. They had lived in this country all this time together and they didn't know each other. So 
that was kind of interesting. Um, if I go into, I can segue into photographs, but let me just look at some of the other memory objects. Most people don't have memory objects, you know, because they came with nothing. You know, my mother's mother's family came in 1890. So they did have things that they brought with them, mostly silk. They had, um, you know, a relative who manufactured silk. But, uh, you know, memory objects don't have to be from the old country. They can be the favorite bowl that your grandmother used to make chodeg. I know I was talking to somebody yesterday who has that bowl of her grandmother's, and every time she uses it, it reminds her of it. So that's what a memory object is. Going into photographs, the photographs are organized so that, you know, here we have a couple pages of photographs, but you can click on a photograph, and then there's not much of a description on this one, but... Um, you can write whatever you'd like about the photograph behind it. And again, there's comments. There's a lot of people. One of the kind of, one of the things I kind of like about doing this are two things from a photographer's point of view. One is the use, the unknowns. There's a lot of people who are part of the family who are obviously close, but unknown. And that to me is kind of interesting. I don't know if I have this up here. If I search for unknown, for instance, in the database, I come up with all these um, people who have, they're unknown people involved in all these stories. If I search, the other thing that kind of interests me is, not to digress too far, but uh, is the, the thing about a backdrop, how people use backdrops all the time to create this image of themselves that they wanted their descendants to know, for instance, this is the Meridian family, they're in front of a backdrop of Niagara Falls, which is, and they're from Hamilton, which is kind of amazing to me. Um, it's beautiful. Uh, here's, an, here's my great uncle, John, who took his whole, all his friends and had a movable feast. They went to a photography studio and got photographed in front of a backdrop. Or this one, which is my more traditional, my grandfather and grandmother when they're in their 20s in front of a backdrop, but the whole, but that as uh, a thing interests me personally, and you can sort by that and the website and sort by any number of different factors um, because what we're using is sort of an archival friendly uh, system. So I got distracted, I apologize for that. Um, going back into photographs, I did find uh, the Ajin family. And again, here's a good example of putting a lot of information behind a photograph. This is a photograph that I didn't know existed and I found it as part of the process. My great aunt Sophie is in the black sitting in the back. I didn't realize she had a sister who was my grandfather's sister. That sister was married to the Ajins, again, tying back to Aram Ajin in the uh, older photograph. The man and the woman on the right and the left were murdered in front of their kids. Uh, the child in the middle was murdered. The girl with her arm on the shoulder was taken as a slave uh, into the Kurdish or Turkish uh, world of, of, as a wife. The two girls on the bottom came to the United States. One had a family, raised a family in the New York, New Jersey area. And the other one was in and out of institutions her entire life because of what she had seen. Um, so photographs have a story and it's not necessarily what you're seeing uh, front and center. This is the family that sponsored our family, to, my grandfather to come here. Again, I had no idea that these people existed. That was kind of an interesting thing. And then there's other photographs like this one. This is my dad's high school and uh, high school graduation. He's on the right and his brother Tom is on the left. But when my grandfather died tragically in the 1920s, their sister, Catherine, left Worcester and got married and moved to the Boston area. So she never went to high school. So I found this like this. They had just taken her picture and put it in there as if it was the three of them, their graduation picture, which was kind of poignant. And it, and it reminded me of this uh, photograph that we got from uh, Claire Malkasian, which was is a photograph which is a common practice where people who had died uh, were not photoshopped but burned back into the photograph um, and there was a, a whole cottage industry to do this and i think uh, and i know uh, ruth tomasians talked about this and i uh, project safe has a number of these photographs which i find fascinating again it's the effort to get family to back together again in, in, in whatever way possible 
Um, then there are some kind of funnier photographs. This is my grandfather and grandmother at the beach. You know, who doesn't go to a beach in a uh, suit and tie? And if you think that's the only one, there's other photographs of him at the beach in a suit and tie. Um, and then there's this photograph, which, you know, means nothing on the surface, I suppose. But my dad just loved to get us, pile us all into the station wagon, listen to us fight all the way up and down the coast of Canada and across Canada, you know, with his mother-in-law, his wife and the five kids and the trailer. But what he would do, which kind of I always found fascinating, but at the time incredibly embarrassing, was that he would look up Armenians under Oriental rugs and invite the whole family over to say hello wherever he went. So he was always like in that mode of wanting to be in the Armenian community, even when he was outside of Whitensville, outside of his comfort zone. And I thought this was pretty unusual until I met my mom's cousin, Mary, and she said, that her family did the same thing, which blew me away. Hey, um, hey, Greg, I'm sorry. I need to interrupt. Um, yeah. Sorry. Can we, can we, we, we do need to kind of move along because our, our time okay. is very limited. And I, okay. and I know that Lisa is, has a few things to say. So okay. we need to I'll open it up to move it right along. Thank okay. you. And this is the last photograph of my mom and dad and Lisa, take it away. I'll stop to share. Hold on a second. Okay, Lisa. Sorry about that, Arto. No problem at all. Looks like my shared. I'm sorry, my share is not working. No, uh, I can, we can, see, I can see it. I think we can see it. I know, but that's oh. the old. Oh, uh, that's item. okay. Okay. So I'm just trying to find what happened here. And here it is. So thank you, Greg. Um, I'm going to walk you through the community. Um, oh, actually, this isn't it either. Looks like I've lost my computer connection. Greg, if I stop the share, um, will you bring up the website and just bring up community? I can't get I can't get the website up. So I'll, I'll leave you to explore community on your own. I'm sorry, we had a whole section to go over with you um, and I wanna leave time for questions. So I'll just move ahead to my concluding thoughts. Okay. Um, as we conclude our, our prepared remarks, I thought it would be appropriate to bring up the, the main website page. And obviously we can't see that. Um, for those of you, uh, for those of us who were working on the project over the last uh, Lisa, year, sorry to interrupt sure. you. I just want to let you know, uh, we're, uh, uh, Margaret, our assistant archivist, just shared that page so people can kind of look at it as you're Excellent. giving Thank your you. closing remarks. Just the homepage. That would be wonderful. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Perfect. For those of us who've been working on the project over the last year, it's been a learning experience. Um, we find ourselves sharing the stories and traditions we have discovered with one another. We hope that for others who visit our website, it's the storytelling that will bring them back over and over, as well as to prompt them to invite others to explore connections. We also hope that the shared storytelling helps connect our present day Armenians to their pasts. It's uh, Greg, Jeff and I were privileged to be raised in such a close-knit Armenian community and to have known so many of the genocide survivors in town as children, something that our current young people did not experience. We've already seen people find long lost family connections as we have worked with families to knit together their own family stories, to translate scribbled messages or lengthy interviews, or to find immigration information. 
whatever the missing link is. We see the opportunity to use this website content to organize more formal community-based conversations about Armenian identity. But we know that visitors to our website may organize their own within family groups or among friends. And if the work we are doing to honor and commemorate our heritage will help new refugees, especially those who experience traumatic uprooting, settle into their new lives in America, we're happy to help them as well. As for the website, we are looking forward to adding new family collections, hosting more of our subtitled oral history recordings that were done decades ago and have gone untranslated for far too long. Um, we definitely want us to post more community content. Um, as you go out to that section, since I wasn't able to bring it up and show you, um, I encourage you to explore, especially in the civic section, um, we have an album that one of our volunteers lovingly put together of our servicemen and women from World War II. Um, we also have 300 copies, digitized copies of the employee newsletter or news magazine from the White Machine Works, which goes back to 1919 and includes a lot of historic information and photographs uh, of the Armenians living in town. Later this fall, Surpa Svadzadzin um, will be commemorating its 65th anniversary of consecration. And we know that will bring forward many more um, items for us to add to our collections as well. Beyond the website, we're looking forward to more events like this and presentations and the prospect for recording new oral histories as Greg mentioned earlier. So we thank you all for your attention and we're happy to take your questions and hear your comments. You know, one thing uh, I wanna say that Lisa was not able to show is she's working on uh, this database with um, a couple of volunteers from Whitensville, which is based off the old magazines that White Machine Works used to publish intermittently from 1919 through the mid sixties. And we're halfway through looking for all Armenian names. We have some, what is it, Lisa? Something like 2,000 names? We have about 2,000 names that we've collected thus far um, among the 300 issues of that magazine that we have digital copies for. Right. And a lot, of, as you can imagine, a lot of the names are misspelled. So we'll have a database at some point of the spelled, correct and misspelled names that anybody can look through and find articles in the magazines about their uh, forebears. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, Lisa and Greg. Um, and, and I'm excited to kind of open up the discussion now. Uh, before I do, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. Um, it's such a lovely project and it's such a, you know, it's good to see, uh, um, <clears throat> as I think Greg mentioned, I think, or maybe Lisa, but uh, that this is definitely the idea of such a specific focus of, of this project, where it's focused on a very specific community um, and it is a kind of like a digital Hushan Madian. It's, it's kind of a digital compatriotic uh, book uh, that maybe a lot of us know of uh, that maybe our parents had or our grandparents or great grandparents. And, and I think um, it's, it's a wonderful uh, project. So I, I do encourage everyone go to armeniansofwhitensville.org uh, to be in touch with Greg, Lisa and the team and to support them um, in whatever way you can. Um, and, and also go to Project Save dot uh, org. Um, you know, these kinds of events, this event that we're doing today, uh, our new website, um, our hopeful uh, move to a permanent uh, larger space where we can have actual exhibits of the uh, vast collection of, of photographs we have so that we can actually physically kind of display a lot of this stuff. Um, that happens uh, through your help and your support. So, so please uh, 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 go to the site, check it out and and, uh, and and also that support is not just monetary as Greg said um, uh, uh, there are digital archives uh, as Ar Armenians of Whitensville is as Husha Madian is hushamadian.org which is also kind of like an Ottoman Empire uh, Armenians of the Ottoman Empire digital archive um, and then what we do is it, these are the hard these are the actual hard copy photographs and um, it's very important for people to understand that um, what Project Save has been doing for all these years, um, as, as Greg said, you know, this is not some dusty 
like, you know, we just collect the photos and forget about them. Um, you know, this is a living archive. Um, it, it's, it's, we, we want to be bringing these photos to life. Uh, and it's not all about old photo, photographs uh, in Project Saves case. We are championing, you know, the beauty and the impact of photography as a universal language that brings people together. Um, so uh, uh, those of you that have photographs sitting around, um, please, you know, be in touch with us so that we can talk about preserving them, but not just preserving them, making sure that they're brought to life. Um, you never know how people connect. As Greg said, as Lisa said, you know, uh, we all, it happens all the time that people donate a collection of photographs to us. They themselves might not quite understand the value, but then either a curator or a researcher or, or, or our archivist right here, they'll realize the value of these historic photographs or someone else comes to Project Save and starts looking through things or is looking through our website and they say, oh my God, wait a minute, I know these people. Or, oh, I grew up in that part of Detroit or in that part of Whitensville or in that part of Cuba or that part of Paris. And suddenly all these different connections start happening. So it's, it's very, very important that people, uh, however you do it, it doesn't have to be Project Save. It doesn't have to be Armenians of Whitensville. Um, you know, in other words, you know, make sure that you are thinking about these things and reaching out to whatever organization uh, makes sense, you know. Um, but I I'm so pleased that, that um, that you guys are doing this project regularly. So I wanted to, there's a few things that you mentioned that I wanted to ask you about. I think I'm gonna start with, um, Greg, I think you were talking about intermarriage. And it's really interesting because, you know, that's something we've been talking about here around the office because now Project Save is actually, um, you know, our archivists are not Armenian. Uh, our founder, Ruth Tomasian is half Armenian. Um, I'm Armenian, but I was born here in Cambridge and, you know, I'm fully bi bicultural, I'm American. So, um, and that's something we've been talking a lot about here at Project Save, that it's very important that as we highlight the vast array of photographs we have, more and more we are noticing and we're starting to categorize and archive and kind of catalog photos that have people in them that are half Armenian, quarter Armenian, intermarriage, all kinds of things. So maybe would you, could you maybe speak a little bit more to that aspect of um, the Whitensville project? Sure, the, we haven't done it yet, but we've talked to a couple families uh, that we wanna collect information from. Mm -hmm. uh, I think about the project, it's really about the community of Whitensville, but it's also about identity. And no matter who you are, you think, I, I would think that you would think like, what is it about me today that how I act, how I think, my logic that I inherited from my parents or my grandparents. And if, it, if there's intermarriage, which there really wasn't much when we were younger, um, then that's certainly a part in a person's identity. And it shouldn't be, it should be celebrated. I mean, I think there was somebody who was asked, um, uh, about their children being half Swedish and half Armenian. And he said, my kids are hundred percent Armenian and they're hundred percent Swedish. And right. I kind of <laughs> liked, the, I liked that. Yeah. And um, that was just a great response. And I wanted to sort of celebrate that in a way and, you know, try to figure out how, when we're talking about identity and evolution of identity and be honest about it, that that's what we would do. Mm -hmm. And, and do you, I'm just curious, do you guys, uh, do you find either in your own personal connection to Whitensville or in the <clears throat> objects and photos that you're getting, do you, are, do you notice? I mean, is there, do you say like, oh, wow, there's a larger percentage than I thought of either intermarriage or people that are not quote unquote, hundred percent Armenian or what? I mean, is that something that's kind of, you've been noticing as you've been putting all this together. No, but I mean, I was talking to um, a woman who, um, one of Claire Malkasian's uh, cousins, who was a quarter Armenian, and she very much identified with the Armenian side. But I started thinking, really, you know, we should be talking about all sides, because mm -hmm. when your kids look at this archive, they want to know not just about one slice of the family, but they want to know about the whole family. So in all fairness, if you're creating a family archive on the site, it should be in total the family. 
right. are we noticing a lot i mean we've, we we're just getting into it i mean we've only been at this for six months we started with um you know a small group of families and we'll be expanding but of course we're going to see that yeah yeah um and I, and I just want to say one. Can I just yeah. say one other thing? Of course. The Armenian word for uh, non-Armenian is Odar, right. and I didn't realize until later on in life that that meant foreigner, which, <laughs> right. I, which I thought was ironic since we were That's the right. foreigners. Exactly. And I was like, exactly. I couldn't. I was like, wow, yeah. it's yeah. just odd. And you know what's but, interesting, Greg, that you say that. One thing that makes me really happy is that, yeah, you know, when I was growing up here around Cambridge, I was, I was a little bit of a. <clears throat> I was one of those, you know, punks hanging out in Harvard Square, and you know, uh, I was a nice kid, but but a little bit rebellious. But you know, I would always kind of bring that up, and and uh, back that back then, I mean, it wasn't that long ago, but 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 even pretty recently, uh, you know, Armenians, whether it was my family or others, they'd get kind of defensive about that, uh, and I knew that, and I, you know, I was a teenager, and I'd like to kind of get them going. But what I've noticed just in the last five years even five, 10 years, more and more people, just like you mentioned, that's, it's like in the air, I feel like, because anytime I've brought it up now, people are like, yeah, that's right. I've been thinking about that. It's like, how could, you know, people, they say, oh, that, but you know, we're the, we, we were immigrants like anybody else. And now we're American. And yet we, you know, we call our neighbors for, <laughs> foreigners, even though we've been here like 80 years. And I think that that is, it's a little thing and it's anecdotal, but I think it does speak to the kind of, you know, what things like genocide or immigration, when people go through hardship, um, they do hold on to a little bit of a tribal mentality and they kind of sometimes might lose sight that they themselves are now part of this larger fabric, uh, whether it's in the United States or whatever country they've immigrated to. Not only that, but what, what's important is that when people come here as refugees, which the Armenians for the most part came, uh, especially the latter half, they come with nothing but their system of beliefs. That's right. it. So they want to hold right. on to that no matter what. And part of holding on to that is you marry another Armenian or you marry another person inside of your faith, whatever it is. So it's not difficult to understand, but that I think is what's going on and what's driving it. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Um, you also mentioned um, something about empathy. So I was wondering if either of you are interested, you know, what, what I think that's that's so important, especially the world. I mean, it's always been important, but perhaps, you know, the world as it is uh, lately um, within and, you know, outside the kind of Armenian experience, what what how would you say the you know empathy, photography, um, empathy, and kind of um, collecting, sharing stories, and so forth? What, what, what do you guys see as the connection there, and why is that important to you? I can certainly speak to that, but Lisa, do you want to say something here? Yeah, I, you know, I would just say that um, in putting together these collections with families, and I think we'll end up experiencing this as well for the communities. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to give people a sense of their past and their whole experience as, as Armenians. And we're doing it for ourselves, but anyone can visit this website. And mm -hmm. those that have heard some stories about Armenians, or maybe they only know Kim Kardashian, I don't know. <laughs> they may come to this website and I think they'll learn. They'll walk away from this with a better understanding of the pressures that especially the earliest Armenians went through. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We presented this project at uh, back in the first week of April, just as the website was coming online to the Northbridge Historical Society as a thank you for them finding the letter that got us our initial publicity. Mm -hmm. And the audience were for the most part, people from town, they were yeah. not necessarily mm -hmm. Armenians. There were some of our community were there, but it was really there. They were interested in this yeah. connection. Yeah. And I think we can continue to try to build that sense of empathy. And that's why we keep saying that perhaps our ex uh, project will be an example for the newest of the refugee communities sure. who will start this experience, especially those that are 
have been uprooted uh, traumatically from their homeland. Yeah. Um, and they'll go through the same cycles, but with a, in a totally different time frame yeah. than our grandparents did. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'd like to add to that just a little bit. I mean, when in the 80s, I did this uh, oral history project with Alvin Bedrosian, and I remember thinking, oh my God, these people who I knew in Whitensville as a kid, I had no idea what they had gone through. Mm -hmm. And to me, they were just ordinary people, uh, beautiful in their own way, but there was no, I mean, I had no idea. And so that made me think about how there's sort of a hero in, in the individual that you might not know unless you talk to them or you might not know like you know my dad used to always say don't criticize somebody unless you walk the mile in their shoes yeah. you learn about people through yeah. doing oral histories and oral history is an exercise in empathy and photography frankly is an exercise in empathy if you right, yeah. are a portrait photographer you, like i i mean i love to photograph people but that means meeting people talking to them understanding their experience understanding different communities that you might not normally be part of and all of a sudden you're part of because you're photographing so i do think it's an, uh that art and photography specifically um oral histories in the process is an empathetic process absolutely yeah um a, a couple of <clears throat> two two things and then i, I wanted to kind of add to what you guys are saying uh one um carolyn um Goff was asking, welcome, Carolyn, by the way. Um, yes, so this, this, all of the events that we do and everything in this series, Conversations on Photography, is recorded. And then it's uploaded to our the Project Save YouTube channel. So if folks go to YouTube, Project Save Armenian Photograph Archives, you'll see this event and you'll see the other events we've done. Um, so just letting people know in case you want to rewatch them or let your friends know about them, or if some of you have to leave or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to, and this is going to connect with this next question from Rose, who maybe is related to Greg. Rose, it's my mother, but I don't think oh! she knows how to use the chat. So oh, I'm, no, no, somebody's probably in hi, there. Hi, 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 Rose. Welcome. Um, so so uh, she was asking um, if the kind of thing you guys are doing with Armenians of Whitensville, if maybe that could be replicated in, in other communities. And, and you know, what I just wanted to say, because that also kind of ties into what we were just answering about uh, uh, empathy and so forth and the immigrant experience. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I'm going to be pushing for pretty soon with, with uh, as, as the new executive director of Project Save is kind of exactly what, what Lisa and Greg and their team are doing. Um, you know, Project Save is the global Armenian experience. It's hard copy photographs. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bird's eye view, immense archive, uh, physical archive. However, what I would like to be doing is encouraging and, you know, uh, in whatever way, connecting these communities and folks that are doing these projects as, as we're doing tonight. Um, so I think absolutely, uh, Ms. Drundanyan, that's a great question. Um, this is something that Project SAVE has tried to do in the past, by the way. Some of that, though, is you have to remember that, you know, for example, in Whitensville, Whitensville's been around for a long time. That community has been around a long time, but it took a Greg and a Lisa and a Jeff and some other folks to make this happen, you know? So it does take, um, it's not just the wanting to do it. A lot of people have these ideas, but you know, it is a lot of work. Um, every little thing, the website, getting together, devoting the time, translating, all that stuff, scanning. It takes a lot of work and it, takes certain types of people to have that chemistry to come together and do it. However, I think absolutely, I think going forward, um, this is something that hopefully will come up more and there'll be more discussions. And as Project Save does more events and as Greg and Lisa and Jeff, and as they spread their word more and the website gets around, hopefully there'll be more of this and there'll be more kind of collaboration. Um, absolutely. Um, guys, there's another question here. Um, do you, are you guys going to be incorporating, since it's not just photography, are you going, going to be incorporating other kinds of objects like, you know, or, or maybe like essays or other kinds of writing in, in your website? Um, well, we do have, uh, there is, yes, the answer is yes. We have diaries. 
-hmm. One person had a diary from, you know, the 1920s and 30s. I'd love to <clears throat> scan that and put that in. Mm -hmm. uh, other people have writings, whether it's poetry or stories. Um, whatever families think draws a sort of picture of the character of their family, it's totally fine. Right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, that you guys really are doing the Hushan Madian type thing, where as you say, you know, memory objects, different types of objects, artifacts, um, and and the other good point you made too, I think, I think it was you, Greg, about um, it's not it doesn't necessarily have to be an old object. You know, right. we all have ephemera, we all have objects that mean something to us in our communities and our our community stories, and I think that that's really uh, important. Um, Craig uh, was asking a question, why can't the Whitensville website be a template that others can use? I mean, it, I'm sure it could, uh, you know, again, it's just, a, I think communities are all different, the people that are in the communities and how they might want to do it or what, what they have to work with. And, you know, it's all uh, community, community by community is all different. But of course, whether it's the Whitensville website, whether it's Project Save, whether it's the Hushamadian uh, website uh, in Europe, there's a lot of templates. I think it's all about just dialogue and people getting to know about these folks and what everyone's doing and then finding different ways to work together or learn from each other and so forth. Um, uh, Brandon is asking, do you got, for, for right now, as you were saying, it's a new website, you're, you might be working out some things still. Is there any particular, is there anything you're going to expand or other things you're going to add to the website that you haven't yet or anything like that? I, I think the, the th biggest challenge will be doing back-end uh, organization and tagging and uh, classifying and marking. Mm -hmm. But as far as the actual site itself, no, the, the, the foundation's in place. Keeping it uh, easily accessible is a lot of work, you know, it looks yeah. easy if it's done right, but it's a lot of work. So yeah, we'll be doing exactly. that's kind of our big challenge. The other challenge is just uh, uh, getting the families um, up and running, which we're totally right. pumped about. Right, right. By the way, I, I have another question. How, how is it with, um, I mean, obviously you guys, you're from there, you, your connections are deep there. So you have a, it, it's, you're not necessarily approaching people kind of cold calling people that you don't really know or whatever, but are you having, you know, uh, we what, are, we are. Yeah, I was just going to ask that because, you know, even when you do know people, um, there is something about people sharing very private things. Right. Um, and so I was going to ask you about that. Are you getting any kind of, you know, people that are hemming or hawing or resisting or. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and I mean, we contacted this woman in Fresno because we came across her tape through, um, Manuks and the, and the Shoah Foundation. And we went without contacting them first. We did all the transcription and the subtitling. And then we sent it to them out of the blue just about a month ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was an example of us doing something without contacting people first. And, you know, that tape yeah. is in the public domain. So uh, we're fine with that. But we, yeah. we contact people all the time. It's, you know, it's not for everybody. <laughs> exactly. so, you know, I'll use that particular story as an example. I, I raised my hand and volunteered to work on the translation. Mm -hmm. And maybe three or four minutes into the tape, I realized she was from the same village my grandfather was from. Mm -hmm. And then the interviewer started asking her questions about her family. And do you know what your mother's maiden name was? And she said, Masakin. And my ears perked up. Right, right. So with enough information that she provided in this interview from the late 1970s, I can place her into the Masakian family tree that's in the Hushamadian book that Greg's ancestor wrote. And can now connect people that are matches to me on ancestry mm -hmm. through this information. So right. you never know with a project like this, someone you know that I thought would have no relationship to me I also was able to, in doing this research, um, to put that translation together, mm -hmm. realized how information she provided in this tape from the late 1970s mm -hmm. was able to finally connect my family to another family in town 
that we knew had been close in the old country that we didn't know exactly how we were related. And now we know how we're related. Wow. So yeah. projects like this are worth all the work that it takes to be involved. Um, right. And it's very rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, by the way, I wanted to switch gears a little bit and get a little technical, if you don't mind. Um, <clears throat> I'm sure our, uh, you know, we, we have a growing uh, team of professional archivists. Um, and so, you know, it, and, and just for uh, uh, the people that have joined us who might be interested in other communities to do something like what you guys are doing. But um, it, technically speaking, how, what did you guys decide? There's so many, uh, um, there's so many platforms and things yeah, people I can, can use. This. Yeah, what yeah. did you guys we use? We started out on WordPress. We started on WordPress. We'd actually designed the whole website in WordPress. We got 500 files in and realized it was a total it was a hot mess to say the least. <laughs> and I was like, okay, we have to start over again. So right. then I, I don't remember exactly how I did it, but somehow got into a forum uh, through the Boston Library of Librarians and asked people if they knew of any uh, open source software out there that they'd recommend. And they recommended Omega. And we might have been better to use a different version of Omega in hindsight, knowing what we know now. Yeah. But uh, Omega is an archival based open source platform that a lot of museums and libraries use. Nice. And we had uh, Nick helped us out as, as best he could um, with it, but eventually we hired somebody, um, Aaron Bell, who's a, who's a professional uh, website designer yeah. in Omega, and he helped us out. He did a great job. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I would say, you know, for anyone, for, for I mean, obviously, uh, uh, for, for people that are getting together as just individuals to do a kind of very specific project like this, as as Greg and Lisa, are, you know, are, are mentioning some of the challenge, it can be very daunting. It's it is a lot of work. It's a lot of dedication, um, and there are a lot of different uh, platforms that one can use. And so it's always good to reach out uh, to folks that are in this kind of work. So. Uh, you can always reach out to Project Save. You can reach out to Greg and Lisa, um, uh, Husham Madian. And also, by the way, uh, you know, uh, there, there are many local museums, local libraries. Uh, they tend to be very helpful with giving tips on what do they find to be the most useful uh, platforms and different technologies, depending on exactly what is it that, that you're looking to do in terms of storytelling and preservation. Um, uh, uh, we need to wrap up soon, um, but I, I wanted to um, ask, what would you say is one of the most unique, because it, it, this is such a, again, it's such a, there's such a personal element for you and for Lisa, for Jeff, for, for your team. What would you say maybe is something, as you've been doing this project, what's been the most maybe unusual or surprising thing that you've kind of come across in, in terms of like, oh my God, you know, all these years I'm connected to Whitensville and suddenly, you know, has there been something that's really kind of surprised you? <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> well, I, I can speak, for, I'll speak for Lisa. <laughs> okay. I know what he's gonna say. Lisa said she's not related to anybody. I mean, nobody. She's now related to everybody in the world. It's unbelievable um, <laughs> how many people she's related to. She's built this community. Um, I found things through DNA testing that I had no idea uh, were true in our family, um, which was pretty fascinating. Um, wow. You know, it's just the process. And yeah. I, you know, I've become more literate with a computer. Yeah. So right. And so so a lot of it is this kind of the, you're you're rediscovering or rediscovering certain personal connections you either, you know, uh, didn't know about or uh, yeah. And I I think, again, that's I think that's it's beautiful. I think that the uh, uh, photography, um, a community coming together to reconstruct and tell its story. Is, is a way to, uh, I believe, is a way to, you know, universalize and, and remind everyone of our humanity. I, I, not to be cliche, right. but 
Um, I think that, you know, uh, and especially something like photography is such a universal language. Um, you know, uh, for example, our, the new advisory board that Project SAFE has is mostly, you know, non-Armenian ac experts in the field. And what's striking, what I love is that when they, they'd never heard of Project SAFE, didn't know, and then when they saw these, the photographs and the vast array and diversity of the collections, their first question wasn't, you know, what village are these people in? Or what part of Detroit is that? They were just blown away. They, it's like, the, you know, you see yourself in photographs, you know, so they saw their own families or their own immigrant stories or their own connection to Boston or Paris or, or uh, Istanbul or wherever it is. Uh, and I think that, um, I think uh, maybe, you know, sometimes we lose sight of that. Just that's a very powerful thing that humanizing, universalizing element that whether it's photography or art or everyday objects, memory objects, um, I think that's really important. Um, Roger Hagopian was just mentioning the documentary um, that um, I think he was involved in about the, the Hood Rubber Company in Watertown and uh, how there are a lot of similarities between all the Armenians that worked in that factory uh -huh. and the the factory in, in Winesville. I think that's that's also an interesting project in and of itself. You know, the the, the mill town, you know, Lowell, all the Armenians in Providence, mm -hmm. Whitensville, Worcester, Detroit, you know, uh, as you know, my, my part of my dad's side that was in Whitensville, then my uncle uh, Hagop ended up in Detroit, where then he worked at the at GM. Um, so, you know, there's all these uh, stories of all the Armenians in these different factory and mill towns that I think is, is, is very interesting to connect. Um, I'll, 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 thank you so much. This is so wonderful. We could kind of go on and on. I hope that one day what I'd love to do is maybe, uh, you know, sometime in the future we can do this in person, I hope. Um, and we can do another event where we get together and maybe we can have an, uh, other members of your team. And we can do an event here uh, in the Boston area. I think that would be that would be wonderful. And I, thank you so so much uh, to everyone uh, for joining us. It's, it, this is uh, you know we're going to be taking a break for the summer. This is our this is our third and final installment of conversations on photography for the summer. As as everyone uh, has a, has a wonderful, hopefully safe and wonderful summer time. Uh, we have a number of. Uh, presenters already lined up for the fall. We have Stepan Shahinian, who's a wonderful photographer based in Brazil, who will be presenting his work. We also have Ilana Bulat, who's the uh, photography uh, conservationist at uh, Harvard University, who will be one of our presenters. Uh, and hopefully we'll be doing more of these events uh, in person. So we hope to be meeting a lot of you in Boston. We'll also continue to Zoom them as well and to record them. But uh, thank you so much, Greg. Thank you so yeah, much, Lisa. Thank you. We encourage everyone to go to armeniansofwhitensville.org. Go and encourage uh, Greg and Lisa and Jeff and their team, support them and contribute. And please uh, go to projectsave.org and, uh, and, and uh, in whatever way, get involved, support us, support all the community organizations doing uh, so much work. Uh, thank you all so much. Have a wonderful Thanks. weekend.